for those of you that are just now joining us, we'll be getting started here in just a couple of minutes. Um, everyone is on mute, so if you would like to jump into the chat and introduce yourself, it'd be great. You should be seeing the first slide of the presentation on your screen. And um, I will uh, ask a favor from those of you on the line to please use the chat to let me know if for some reason you're not seeing the screen. Um, hopefully, I have a strong enough connection to, to host this, but we're in sort of uncharted territory. Vivi, are you still seeing the, the first slide there? I am not seeing the first slide. Oh, no. I'm seeing end of slideshow. What is happening? Well, this is why we came up with plan B. Okay, uh, how about now? Same thing, it just says end of slide slope, so click to exit. Okay. Wow. Well, Vivi, I'm um, we're going to start with Plan B, and I'm going to work on getting my um, screen to share again in the meantime. So I'll just um, I'll bring the slides up as soon as I can, but hopefully everyone received the PDF of the slide deck. I'm going to start there. I'm going to work on troubleshooting the technical issues on my end, um, and then I'll try to get the screen shared for everyone. So I'm going to start really quickly with an introduction and then pass it on to Vivi. Vivi, you can just kind of let folks know which slide you're on as you go if, if you don't mind. Sounds good. Great, thanks. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for today's webinar. This is Megan Roberts, Executive Director for AWI. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. I've mentioned that everyone on the call is currently on mute. Um, that's just to keep background noise to a minimum so we can use the chat feature to share any questions or comments. Um, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be shared with all the participants within the next day or two. We have submitted a request for approval for the MCLE credit to the State Bar of California. That request is still pending. Um, I assume that they have some delays given the current situation. But when we receive the approval, we will distribute a certificate of completion to everyone via email. As mentioned in the, re in the reminder email, and, and as I'm currently experiencing, some webinar services have been experiencing congestion on their systems due to the large increase in virtual workers over the past couple of weeks. You are currently not seeing the video feed, but if I'm able to bring it back up and you um, experience difficulty with slides advancing, please just follow along using the PDF of the slides that we've provided. And uh, hopefully you've all joined using the dial-in number instead of relying on your computer connection for the audio feed. 
Um, if you're having other technical issues, you can use the chat and I'll do my best to help troubleshoot. So with that out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce Viviana Hugger uh, of Council at Myers Nave in the firm's land use and environmental law practice group. Vivi is an accomplished regulatory attorney with deep experience in complex environmental compliance matters, and we're delighted to have her to share her knowledge with us today. We really appreciate Nav Myers Nave's support um, offering us this webinar. So with that, Vivi, I'll let you go ahead and uh, get started. Thank you, Megan. And good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. It's um, a little ironic that today, you know, we'll be discussing fur and polyfluoral alkyl substances, or, or PFAS, as we say, uh, at a time when nationwide we're really, you know, facing a different kind of contaminant in the form of the coronavirus. And I guess um, one of the things that, that we can say from the get-go is the public awareness does exist for both of these, and um, although they're, they're obviously very drastically different in risk. So with that said, I hope everyone is safe and um, we can approach our ambitious agendas together this morning. So next slide, please. So on slide number two, which is not up on my screen yet, but nonetheless, we've set forth an agenda. Um, I have about five things that I want to talk about. There's so many things that we can talk about. And um, the first item we'll kind of go through quickly, and that is background, because I'm fairly confident that um, most of us have some level of background. Then we'll go into regulatory actions, some increased uh, liabilities associated with um, primarily manufacturers of PFAS to date. And then um, we'll try to spend a good deal of time on the regulatory actions in California. If we have time, we'll, we'll um, kind of touch on some things that are next on the horizon. Next slide, please. So in terms of background, next slide. Uh, about the PFAS, so these are a, a family of chemicals, and they're known as fur and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And they've been in use for a long time, since the 1940s. And uh, the, um, the, the unique thing about these chemicals is that they have very heat resistant and non-stick properties. So they have a very unique way of being um, very stable, uh, both in the products that they use and unfortunately in the environment. And so uh, they have been used for a variety of uses, anything from waterproof clothing or shoes, um, nonstick cookware, which of course we've all heard about, uh, fast food packaging. Uh, if you uh, Google PFAS, uh, you'll, you'll get a picture of a uh, pizza uh, cardboard box. And so fast food packaging has been um, a use for PFAS chemicals because of the nonstick property. So very um, um, important chemical and has been used in a lot of different consumer products. And then in addition to that, uh, the PFAS chemicals are a key ingredient in firefighting foam. And the reason for that is because they are heat resistant and they're able to um, smother a fire in a way that other you know, products cannot. Next slide, please. So looking at slide number five, um, what we're seeing right now is that PFAS chemicals are ubiquitous in the environment. In fact, the statistic that's widely cited is that 99% of Americans exhibit some form of PFAS actually in our bloodstream. So the other widely um, publicized statistic is that we have confirmed detection of PFAS in drinking water. That is a major concern, and also detections of PFAS in groundwater and in soil. Uh, along with that, EPA has stated that um, PFAS are linked or associated with certain types of health issues, uh, depending on the type of chemical involved. It could be uh, high cholesterol, liver, liver problems, types of cancers. Um, so a lot of concern with these chemicals. Next slide. So slide six. Um, this is just kind of a snapshot of PFAS exposure and contamination routes. So when, when we think about all the things that PFAS are included in, it, it, it's important to sort of boil down 
what is the exposure, what are the routes, and I'll try to boil it down here to two things um, based primarily on what the State Water Resources Control Board has um, publicized in, in California. So how were they introduced into the body? Well, number one, eating or drinking contaminated food or water. So let's take food, for example. So food can be contaminated with these chemicals because of the migration of the PFAS from the packaging into the um, food item. The other item is the bioaccumulation of PFAS into food products. So you would have crop uptake um, at times, possibly, one of the areas being studied, as well as bioaccumulation of PFAS in the aquatic environment, in uh, you know, fish, and also in meat, eggs, um, or um, as I've already mentioned, crops, leafy vegetables. So that, that goes to our food. The other way that exposure routes for humans occur is by liquid. So water um, obviously can be contaminated in the traditional way, a contamination from nearby manufacturing facilities that either manufactured the PFAS chemicals themselves or used the, um, some form of PFAS as, an, as a component or a chemical ingredient in the product that they were um, producing. So contamination from nearby um, facilities, that's a pretty traditional way. And the other way is that products that contain PFAS can actually be deposited on the ground um, through their use uh, or through aerial deposition into rivers and lakes. And of course, you could have traditional spills. So that are, that's kind of the two ways of sort of eating and drinking. And then the other um, item of exposure is breathing in or touching products treated with PFAS, such as carpets or clothing. That's of concern for firefighters. Um, the clothing that firefighters use obviously needs to be heat resistant and for that reason would have been treated with the PFAS chemicals. Okay, turning now to slide six. So with all that said, these, uh, it's not surprising that these chemicals are uh, called forever chemicals. I meant to say slide, um, slide seven. And um, there is just a push um, from public health act activists to just altogether ban these chemicals because they are forever chemicals because of their stability. So we do um, have, obviously, information to confirm that in terms of military sites, there's at least 600 contaminated military sites, which is a huge concern. And um, because these chemicals have been, uh, has been tested and evaluated for quite a long time, we do know the two most harmful PFAS, and those are the perfluoroanic acid, or the PFO8, um, and that's also known as C8 and the perfluoral octane sulfonic acid, or PFOS as in SAM. So those are the two that have been studied most often, and um, they're, they're considered the most harmful and associated or actually linked with liver damage, cancer, um, and a range of adverse health effects, um, including reproductive toxicity, is um, the potential associated with those. Next slide. Turning to slide eight, so these uh, forever chemicals are widely in the news in, in terms of California. Um, one statistic is that drinking water sources for 74 community water systems that serve 7.5 million Californians are contaminated with the PFAS chemicals. But that's from an environmental working group, and now, of course, we're going to have more data in about that. that and we have lower limits, so those um, numbers will probably um, be adjusted upward or downward depending on how that data comes out. Also, um, on slide eight, um, we noticed that on the federal level, there's uh, more than 40% of the systems that were evaluated had, had at least one sample with a level above the 70 parts per trillion um, lifetime health advisory level for PFAS. Next slide. So turning to slide nine, federal uh, level activities. So we know that, e that EPA, as indicated on the prior slide, has detected PFOA and PFOS at levels above the health advisory of 70 ppc. 
And the updated number is that 63 water systems, or 1.3 percent, that serve an estimated 5.5 million um, individuals are impacted with these chemicals. So that um, brings us then to California. So California, uh, and of course some other states, have evaluated, of course, and, and held on to for some period of time the 70 PPT health advisories from the federal level, but now um, we have set our own levels that are lower than EPA's health advisory. And the reason that we've done that is the way that we evaluate health risk here goes not only through the State Water Resources Control Board, but all, also through the Office of Health and Hazard Assessment, or OEHA. So based on OEHA's recommendation, um, we, as California, our, our State Water Resources board has set those levels lower. One state that we wanted to highlight in our presentation to you this morning was Michigan. So, so Michigan um, has, has indicated it's, it's very hard hit. Um, it has reported 192 PFAS contamination sites, and that's more than any other state. So we're going to see more uh, from Michigan. That's an area that um, is going to be probably rapidly developing and quite instructive as those, um, as those um, sites are being addressed. Now, next slide. Turning to slide 10, um, just briefly on the aqueous film forming foams, or AFFF. Now these foams, are, I, sometimes I, they're firefighting foams, they contain a high concentration of the PFAS chemicals. And they have to have those chemicals in them because they are um, used for public safety situations where there is a fire at a refinery, an industrial facility, from a plane crash, something of that nature. And allegedly, be because of the component of the active ingredient in these forms, this is the PFAS, allegedly there's quite a bit of PFAS release uh, in large quantities when, when a fire is active and, and has to be put out. So, Depending on the management of, of the firefighting foam, it could um, lead to a release. And we have to keep in mind that in terms of the firefighting foam, these foams are required by law at civilian airports, and of course um, that is because they're effective and they extinguish fires and preserve human life. And when there's, <clears throat> at least as far as I know, there's no um, publicized alternative foam that would do that. So these firefighting foams, depending on how they're used, could, could be a source of release into the ground, into groundwater um, from the paved surfaces that uh, they would traditionally be used on. Next slide. Okay, concluding um, our kind of section on background, there is a lot of national awareness associated with the PFAS chemicals. Um, some of you, I'm sure, that are joining us this morning are aware of, of three major uh, films. Um, the Dark Waters film with Mark Ruffalo, who plays Robert Bellat, one of the leading um, personal injury attorneys that um, is bringing cases still today um, with regard to uh, impacts from these chemicals. And then, uh, related to that, The Devil We Know, which is um, a similar storyline but in a documentary perspective and then the movie No Defense. So a lot of national awareness on this particular chemical and uh, probably will continue in that regard. Next slide. So turning to regulatory action, uh, and as indicated on slides 12 and 13, we have so many things going on. On the federal level, we have at least 30 bills. I've seen. Um, you know, numbers as high as 42, and I can't. We can't possibly, uh, you know, go through or even lump together these different kinds of bills. But there is just so much activity associated with PFAS, and as we'll see, that's probably because we have so many different uh, frameworks in, into which PFAS can be regulated. So we're not going to touch on those, but I, I wanted to alert everyone, obviously, that they're out there. And next slide, um, on, turning to slide 14 want to pause and take a look at the main area of regulation that we've seen or legislation that we've seen, and that is under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. So that act, as we know, is intended to protect um, 
public drinking waters. And stepping back, we need to consider how the framework under that act works. So EPA is directed under that act to regulate if three findings are made. Number one, EPA has to find an adverse health effect. They also need to, number two, find a contaminant that is either known to occur or substantially likely to occur in a water system. And then number three, EPA would need to find that the regulation presents a, an, a meaningful opportunity to reduce health risk. Next slide. So, uh, where are we in terms of slide 15? Where are we with uh, the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act? So right now we have no maximum contaminant levels or MCLs for PFAS on the national level. We, we, that is not anything that has been promulgated yet. But we do have EPA initiating steps uh, to, to lead to the need for an MCL particularly for PFOA and PFOS. And that process is going to be a multi-step determination process. Um, it, it started with EPA issuing this non-enforceable health advisory for PFOA and PFOA of 70 PPT. Now, we hear that number, and we think it's a recent number, but actually that was implemented or announced or in 2016. And one of the frameworks in this multi-step process is the Safe Water uh, Drinking Act directs EPA to evaluate these chemicals every five years. So in 2016, we have 70 PPT. If we look five years earlier, the provisional health advisory was 200 to 400 PPT. So you have a dramatic shift downward in that five-year period, and we're going to continue most like well, I, I can't predict what's going to happen on a federal level, um, but with the amount of data and attention that's going on, um, that is an area of study and an area that EPA will likely is, is required to revisit. So what does this health advisory level, what does it represent under the um, Safe Drinking Water Act. So the level really is intended to describe a, a non-enforceable, non-regulatory concentration of drinking water contaminants at a level which, um, at or below that level, adverse health effects are not anticipated to occur over a specific exposure duration um, that is involved in, that, in, the, in the, the formulation of that level. So that's what the health advisory is intended to represent, and, and it is, um, you know, at this point, um, four years old. Next slide. Turning to slide 16, uh, we want to turn to a few recent congressional activities, um, particularly the National Defense Authorization Act that was enacted recently, and then we're going to look at CERCLA just briefly. And then of interest, I, I think, was uh, the testimony by 3M Company in um, late last year uh, during the congressional panels associated with uh, these many, many congressional activities. Next slide. So slide 17. So here we have the NDAA, or the National Defense Authorization Act, as I mentioned it was enacted late last year, and it amends the Safe Drinking Water Act. It has a lot of provisions, but let me just highlight a couple. The main intention was this act. Because of the 600 known military sites that are contaminated, the main intention here was to bar military funds from being used to purchase firefighting foams that have more than one part per, per, per uh, uh, should be per trillion probably, sorry about that typo, PFAs by October 1st, 2023. And along with that, a corollary to that is that the Defense Department is to publish military specifications 
for a, a, basically an alternative to the current uh, AFFF phone that is being used. Now, like with every piece of legislation, and as every lawyer knows, there's always exemptions, and one of the main exemptions that was very, very clear during the legislative process is you could not have anything other than the PFA, uh, PSAs containing foam on ocean-going vessels. There just isn't a, an alternative to be used on seafaring vessels, and so PF, PFAS foams are still used and will continue to be used uh, on those types of vessels. The other thing about these amendments is it does have a very lengthy waiver provision. So this is not new to, um, to anyone on this call, but as we all know, especially from a legal perspective, we have seen a lot of um, legislation and regulation that, is, that forces new technology, forces new products. And here we have a waiver provision under the NDAA that allows existing products to continue to be used because it's unclear, as we're all here today talking about it, whether there really is going to be an alternative for the AFFF that's going to protect public safety as much. So I'm predicting that that waiver provision in the legislation will be used quite a bit. Um, and it's there and it's, um, you know, probably going to be necessary from time to time. Uh, next slide. Turning then to slide 18, two other um, sections of the Act that are worth highlighting, 7311 and 7312. So 7311, because this is the Safe Drinking Water Act Amendment, requires the addition of more PFAS chemicals to the EPA Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, or UCMR, that's, that's um, revisited every five years, and um, the current one is number five. So that, that section does impose that. And then the other thing is with regard to which PFAS are going to be added to the UCMR, it applies to all PFAS where there's validated test methods. And that's one of the areas of great um, difficulty right now and we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. But at least uh, for the ones that do have validated test methods, they will be included in the next um, monitoring cycle. And then under 7312 of the Act, there is um, a fund, because the Safe Drinking Water Act does have a fund, but now additional resources are available there. Uh, for uh, the revolving fund grant program, and that's available to water systems to address this emerging contaminants, to deal with the, um, the cost, of eligible costs associated with dealing with the PFAS. Next slide. So slide number 19 um, is just intended to highlight some objections to the NDAA that came up during the legislative process. We have the current administration um, voiced some opposition to the act because, one, the Department of, of Defense, um, the, the, the thinking is it should not be prohibited from using the fluorinated firefighting foam um, before a viable equivalent replacement has been identified. And that really has been the main ob uh, objection um, associated with the legislative process. And similarly, the American Chemical Chemistry Council voiced even more strong opposition, um, indicating that products should not be banned outright, that alternatives may not be as effective in emergency situations, and that the lack of alternatives could lead to increased risk in public safety. So that is, um, you know, just very much um, sums up what some of the objections were, um, and so we do have the waiver provision that uh, I did mention is very detailed and probably will be in use unless all alternatives are implemented and identified. Next slide. Turning now to slide 20 and pausing for a minute on CERCLA. Very, very controversial here. So we have, um, not surprisingly, a split um, between party lines. So Democrats pushing for a Superfund amendment to add PFAS as hazardous under federal law, and this would force PFAS producers to pay for cleanup 
and that cleanup would be in the billions of dollars. Now, during the legislative process, particularly late last year, DuPont affirmed a support but only for PFOA and PFOS, which has been largely phased out. And so um, that's, an, that's an interesting development. Uh, during that process, though, however, 3M declined to do that. And that's an, that's an interesting area to, to kind of um, be aware of as well. Now, on the conservative side, there was a lot of um, opposition to the bill to list PFAS under CERCLA. So uh, one of the items that is a, you know, kind of a, a grave concern is the, the use of CERCLA as a legal you know, mechanism to impose cleanup liabilities on parties that have been using these chemicals in good faith. So CERCLA is really meant for um, it was something, well, obviously, for intentional dumping or spilling. Um, but as we're going to see later in the presentation, CERCLA, like other laws, and similar to our, um, our Porter Cologne Act in California for water quality, it's based on this concept of discharge. What is a discharge? What's a release? And um, when you're using a chemical in good faith, such as the firefighting foam, one would question whether that's that's really a discharge, or is that, you know, like the use of pesticide or anything else that's applied, is, is that really within the CERCLA framework? So very, very controversial to, to, to think about whether CERCLA is actually going to be amended to, to add um, some of these chemicals. So uh, the, the other idea, and I think we're already kind of seeing this, is uh, if you designate PFAS as hazardous substances, that would trigger a, lot, a high amount of cleanup liability under CERCLA for a lot of entities, including the Department of Defense. So that, that's a great concern. So the other idea is instead of having actually a CERCLA liability scheme, is to have another um, PFAS kind of package for cleanup apart from CERCLA. Um, CERCLA, as we all know, especially all the lawyers in, in the room, it, it's just kind of a black hole of liability. You're kind of just never get out even when you have um, a clear you know, defense that you could advocate. It's, it's very, very hard to extract yourself from circular liability. So the thinking um, is perhaps a, a different type of PFAS liability scheme that is set apart from circular. So, so the future will tell on that. Next slide. Slide 21, I just, I just dropped this in there. Um, it's kind of interesting, 3M, during its congressional testimony, did give a commitment to clean up its site, um, but insisted that uh, the PFAS caused no proven health um, effects and that the current public exposure levels have not been unsafe. So that's kind of the, the part of the congressional record there. Next slide. Okay, slides uh, 22 and 23. Uh, are intended to highlight for you the EPA um, PFAS action plan. And the, the action plan was um, is a guidance document, and it was um, published in February 2019. But I also want to highlight for everyone on, on today's webinar that um, EPA has um, posted the PFAS action plan program update. And that's dated February 2020. It was issued um, just just um, a handful of weeks ago. Very, very informative, and probably, I think, from, uh, for me, probably the best summary of everything on the federal level um, that's occurring, and um, providing an update to that is, is quite, quite helpful. So let's touch on a couple of these things. So the first thing, the primary um, item is to to continue the regulatory process under the Safe Drinking Water Act and to de develop MCLs for PFOA and PFOS. And then also, um, EPA is not only you know, looking at those chemicals, but has about another six or seven emerging PFAS chemicals that are really um, getting quite a bit of attention, and those are going to continue to be studied, and they're um, known as PFBS, uh, the perfluorobutane sulfonic acid. That one will be easy to remember because, well, because the last two, F PFBS is kind of easy to remember. And then um, we also have PFDA, 
PFNA. Um, we also have the Gen X chemicals and PFHXS and PFBA. So quite a few additional chemicals is highlighted um, in the program update that's available on EPA's webpage. So, so again, EPA is instituting um, the process for MCLs for PFOA and PFOS and along the way assessing MCLs for a broader class of, of PFAS chemicals and at least um, six or seven are noted in that program update um, on the webpage which is February 2020. The other thing that, um, that EPA is, is continues to be committed to do is to initiate a process to list the PFOA and the PFOS as hazardous substances under CERCLA. So um, there are the CERCLA you know, concerns associated with those chemicals, but at least with those two, um, EPA announced you know, last month in its update that it is continuing to um, keep that process going. Next slide. Okay, slide 23, oh, this is just a handful of all the kind of the high level uh, things in the action plan. So let's go through these a little bit because um, I have so many of them listed here. So number one as usual, EPA is very committed to expanding and strengthening enforcement. Now that's kind of interesting because we often hear, well, PFAS isn't regulated on the federal level, but you know, that's really not so. There's, there's quite a few other enforcement tools in the toolbox that EPA can use. And the program update that's posted on the webpage highlights a few of those. Just as we in California are seeing Water Code 13267 orders that we're going to talk about, on the federal level, EPA has been issuing um, information requests under CERCLA, under RICRA, under TOSCA. So there are enforcement tools, and um, they are, and, and EPA is committed and has been um, issuing enforcement under PFAS. Now, very interestingly to me, from a legal perspective, is a recent um, consent decree uh, against Wolverine Worldwide, which was a, a leather tannery. It's um, focused. It's, it's one of the um, items that's focused upon in the action plan program update. Here, EPA brought enforcement through RICRA under the Eminent Substantial Endangerment Clause, and at that particular location, there were both hazardous substances and RICRA concerns, and there was also PFAS contamination. So I think what we're going to continue to see is circular RICRA actions that are brought in enforcement, and then PFAS cleanup directives that are tacked on um, that the party's going to voluntarily clean up. So, so enforcement um, is alive and well and will continue. Uh, EPA is committed to that and is pursuing that. Okay, the second item that is largely being um, focused upon, and this is because of the, the NDAA amendment, and that is reporting of releases under the toxic release inventory. So TRI reporting is under the Emergency Planning and Right to Know Act, uh, or EPCRA under the federal level, and there's quite a bit of activity there. We'll touch on that in our next slide briefly. The other thing is, um, Again, with regard to drinking water, to, um, to continue to monitor that. Um, along with water, bullet number four, EPA is looking to develop guidance to facilitate cleanup of contaminated groundwater. So how do we do that? What are the levels? How do we, what are the screening levels? What are the preliminary remediation goals? So what is currently the screening level, I think, is, is 40 P, PT. Um, for the PFOA and the PFOS, and then the preliminary remediation goal um, that EPA is, is thinking about using is the 70 PPT. So that's, that's um, on the horizon. The EPA is looking at what to do with the Clean Water Act and whether water quality objectives or criteria need to be set. That is going to be a, an area of a, a lot of activity. The next item, because uh, we have so many um, federal laws on the federal scheme is TOSCA. So there are uh, new chemical reviews under TOSCA, which of course was just recently amended not that long ago, two or three years ago, and um, there's a significant new use ruling under, um, under TOSCA that's in place because also, you know, it's interesting. So 
although we have a ban of PFOS and PFOA in, in, uh, in the United States, and there's also companies that are voluntarily phasing out these chemicals, under TSCA, interestingly, there's a little bit of a loophole <laughs> that um, you can import uh, certain um, types of chemicals, uh, certain kinds of items that contain PFAS chemicals as surface coatings. So the idea with the significant new use ruling is to use TSCA to um, require reporting if these chemicals that are otherwise banned are going to be used. And so that is in play. Um, EPA is still looking at existing uses because, again, the pro the, these chemicals are banned for certain uses, but there's still a lot of activity with regard to what's an existing use and what's going to be a significant new use, and um, TOX is the, the tool for doing that, and there's going to be a lot of activity there. And then the other two items are looking at um, expanding testing and analytical methods, both for treatment and remediation, and then lastly, um, I guess I shouldn't say lastly, but it's kind of last on the list, is EPA's commitment to look at e ecological risk. So we're talking about um, the aquatic environment, the food chain, hunting, fishing, those kinds of things are, are sort of next on the horizon. Okay, next slide, slide 24. So I don't want to spend too much time here because I want to get, oh, well, California's just around the corner. Um, but this is the TRI reporting. So. Um, EPA originally added 160 PFAS to the TRI, the Toxic Re Release Inventory Requirements, and that's also part of the um, NDAA amendment. Um, that number is now 172. I looked on the webpage this morning, and so um, they have revisited the, the particular chemicals. So what's going to be required there is for companies to report emissions um, and to take uh, that information because of the TRI inventory reporting uh, framework is public information. And then um, kind of along with the TOSCA uh, framework that I just mentioned, the um, companies that are covered by TOSCA are required to get approval before significant new uses. And what we've seen as these um, additions of, of PFAS to the TRI has occurred is companies claiming that trade secrets apply, uh, that would exempt certain things from public disclosure. And, and that's not surprising, because if you think about how um, consumer products are, they're, um, they're formula-based. And so if the PFAS ingredient is very, very important to the way that formula is put together, um, companies are, of course, going to petition uh, to claim trade secret um, from and you know avoid public disclosure of the particular chemicals associated with their products. Um, but along with that, just as with other environmental laws, you have to really substantiate that um, claim and um, you know qualify for the protection. Okay, next slide. So slide 25. Um, this is uh, just a high level of what. The California State Water Resources Control Board is um, is doing uh, with regard to the PFAS attention and our different approach here in California. So, so three things to to sort of touch upon. One is notification levels. We have notification levels at 5.1 ppt for PFOA, 6.5 ppt for PFOS, and now um, we have new lower response levels. These have been lowered to 10 ppt for PFOA and 40 ppt for PFOS. And then also the State Board has a mapping tool on its webpage um, that is live and showing um, the, the detections associated with these uh, notification and response levels. Next slide. It's slide 26. So let's kind of look at some some of the latest activities associated with PFAS. So um, I think many of us that are here gathered together are, have seen the investigative orders. They have been issued by the State Board to airports, to landfills, to chrome platers. And about 600 public water supply wells have been sampled. So we do have quite a bit of data as a result of these investigative orders. 
And although we don't have all the data in yet, about 25% of the data has been reported, we have detections of PFOAs, PFOS, and other PFAS chemicals in half of the well samples. So when, when the rest of the data, about 90% of the data is anticipated by the fall of 2020, and then uh, the chrome plating facilities that um, in a misting process use the PFAS chemicals, their data is expected by late 2020. So once the data is gathered, uh, the, the state board's activities in the future will involve, uh, similar to the federal level, public health goals, concentration of state um, maximum contaminant levels, and then we're also going to see investigative orders that, um, that require source investigation at refineries and bulk terminals. So the refineries, as, as one can imagine, um, and bulk terminals with the presence of petroleum um, and petroleum hydrocarbon containing materials, uh, if you do have a fired refinery, or the refinery um, does use the AFFF foam to put out those fires um, just as airports and, and the military would have been doing for safety reasons. Okay, next slide. Slide 27. So the next few slides, I just want to go over these um, different levels associated with detections of PFAS, notification levels, response levels under the um, under AB 756 that um, has been uh, enacted in California. So we have the Department of Drinking Water um, that had you know, prior to AB 756, issued monitoring orders under Health and Safety Code 116400. So if you're a party that has received a DDW monitoring order under 116400, you are not required to comply with Health and Safety Code 116378 orders that are the, the new authority the State Board has under AB 756. So those orders are under a different rate statutory scheme than the new orders that the State Board is issuing. So DDW orders are different from the State Board orders, um, and they don't trigger, the, the DDW orders don't trigger the same notification um, concerns and other requirements of public disclosure as do the orders from the State Board under the AB, 70, uh, AB 756 framework, which is now Health and Safety Code 116378. So with that said, if you have any confirmed detection of any PFAS, not PFOA and PFOS, under the new legislation, we have to include that in the, the water system has to include that in their annual consumer confidence report. So that's in addition to reporting the detection to the governing board of the local agency. So the new um, requirement is to include that in the annual consumer confidence report, and that's for a detection. Next slide. Okay, slide uh, 28. Um, this is on notification levels. As I mentioned, um, we have notification levels for PFOA and PFOS, and if a water system detects that above the notification levels, it has to notify the governing board and the water systems that directly supplied, um, the water systems directly supplied with that water. And then it may or may not follow the recommendation to notify uh, customers and consumers. So that's for detections above the notification levels. Next slide. So slide 29, here we're having detections above the response level in California. The new response levels have been dropped from 70 PPT um, to 10 PPT for PFOA, and from 70 PPT to 40 PPT for PFOS. Now, this is where the pretty stringent requirements come in, and this is where we're really feeling the impact, uh, even though 25% of the data is only in. So when testing indicates that response levels have been exceeded, and as we saw on the prior slide, um, that occurred so far in, what did we say, 50% of the well samples, 50% of the well samples. So here the choices are that the drinking water provider has to either take the source completely out of service, 
It could treat or blend to achieve compliance. I'm not sure how feasible that is. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, number three, or it could provide public notice within 30 days to the public and the local governing authority. So of those options, taking the water source out of service is probably the most immediate option, um, I guess, um, that, that's going to be used out in the field. Because treatment um, to achieve compliance is going to require, I would guess, infrastructure. You, the, the infrastructure doesn't exist, the novel emerging contaminant, how it's going to be treated, how you can effectively uh, remove it is still sort of at the um, you know, initial stages. So that's going to take some time. Blending to achieve compliance would, would appear to be quite costly um, as other water sources um, need to be identified. So um, those are the three options. Uh, most likely, um, number one is going to be the one that's used. Now, a little bit of relief here. The State Board has um, issued guidance uh, it's called the AB 756 fact sheet. I'm sure most of us on the call have seen this. And you calculate these exceedances by using a quarterly running annual average. So um, I'm sure there's many more people that are more technically qualified than I am to discuss that. But generally speaking, you're averaging um, the results over four quarters. And if you know in your first quarter, the guidance specifically says that you divide by four, and then you continue to average from, from there. So that, that's um, a little bit of relief in terms of how you calculate the exceedance of the RL. Okay, next slide. Slides 30, 31, and 32 um, touch on the public notice. So this is very, um, very interesting. Different notice requirements if option number three in that prior slide are used. So for community water systems, there's four things that, require, that are required, you, you know, direct mail, email notice, internet notice. Those are pretty substantial notice mechanisms. And then in addition to that, it's one or more of the following. You have to do newspaper or actual physical notices in public places, social media, or notice to community groups. So quite a bit of notice um, required um, for the community water system. Next slide. Slide uh, 31 just summarizes the uh, notice provisions for non-transient, non-community water systems. And here there's only two, posting the notice in public places or using one or more of the itemized items there. And, uh, and again, the fact sheet goes over that. Next slide. Okay, slide 32, public notice. So here is... Um, this, this, to me, is so similar to Prop 65 that many of us are, are familiar with. It actually, it's, it's a little bit more onerous and stringent than Prop 65, um, but it, it has some, some similar characteristics. So the public notice has to be very specific. It has to obviously describe the detection and how it is above the response level. Um, it has to describe the potential adverse health effects. We're, we're used to seeing that in other environmental notices. Um, have to state, obviously, the name and uh, phone number and contact information of the water system operator. And then it has this very unique requirement that it has to encourage the recipient to distribute the notice. And there's a very specific language um, that, that says, you know, ask, you know, distribute this notice or we encourage you to distribute the notice. And the last thing that's very similar to Prop 65 is requirements about the font size, having to be at least 12.5. Um, and then uh, unique to this requirement is it has to be an eye-catching display, um, and that it has to be understandable to someone with at least eighth grade education. We have language requirements. So if you have predominantly a Spanish-speaking area or areas where um, people are non-English speaking, you need to provide the notice in, in the language of the, of the population there. And then almost exactly from Prop 65 is that the notice has to omit language that minimizes the notice. So, so what we would see for years with Prop 65 is you had some notices that would say, 
these chemicals, or, or no, better yet, the notices would say, uh, the state of the California requires me to give you this, this notice. Uh, these chemicals may expose you, uh, or these chemicals may cause cancer, reproductive toxicity. So those kinds of notices under Prop 65 are, are considered not effective, and the, the re that particular statutory scheme does not allow um, extra language that minimizes the notice. So what, what's going to be required here similarly is a notice that's very, very direct, very, very boilerplate, and does not have any extra language that in any way detracts from the notice. Um, so that's, that's a very um, big requirement and a very um, difficult one, I think, to, to tackle uh, once those notices get drafted. Next slide. Okay, slide uh, 33 just provides you a timeline of the response levels, public health goals, and MCL goals that the State Board has issued. And I'm not going to go over those, but I wanted to provide them for you for your information. And as you could see, it's not going to be until about fall of 2023 um, when um, we would expect to have MCLs to be effective. Next slide. We do have recent bills um, in California, slide 34. SB 1044, which originated in Santa, uh, from uh, state senators in the Santa Monica area, would ban the manufacture, sale, and use of firefighting foam that contains PFAS in two years from now. And it would mandate that manufacturers of firefighting gear uh, provide written notice that the chemicals, that the equipment contains PFAS. Next slide. We also have SB 1056 that originated in the La Cunada, uh, uh, Flint Ridge area, and this would direct the state board to develop methods to measure all PFAS chemicals um, that are found in drinking water, groundwater, and um, surface and wastewater. So right now, as many of us know, we have an estimated 4,700 PFAS chemicals, 600 are in active use, and we can only test for about 30. I think the EPA guidance I saw lists 29 that can be tested. Uh, perhaps the number has gone up in, in the last couple of weeks. But, but at any rate, um, we have a, a lot of work to do in terms of testing these chemicals. Next slide. Slide 36 and 37. So some concerns to, to kind of pause and think about with regard to California's approach. So with regard to the AFFF, it, it, Right now, according to fire authorities, is the most effective way to combat a Class B fire, and, and that's intended to save human lives. It, it cuts off oxygen, it extinguishes the fire, it stops it from relighting, it just completely smothers it. And the thinking is that some fire stations will really need to continue to have Class B foam on hand uh, to extinguish those kinds of fires, and, and that is for the preservation of human lives. So, so currently there's, um, there's very limited uh, PFAS-3 uh, Class B foams that are effective. So that's, that's one major concern. Next slide. So slide 37, um, one of the concerns, of course, is increased costs for businesses as they find replacements um, for these you know, very useful chemicals that have very useful properties we've grown accustomed to for decades. And then also for wastewater treatment facilities and water utilities. Um, to try to develop the effective testing, um, you know, methods and remediation methods, methods, and sometimes to look for alternative sources of water, um, those are huge um, kinds of costs that would have to be incurred. Next slide. And continuing with those concerns, slide um, 38, there's um, many voices out there that say there's just actually no evidence that exposure to um, low levels of concentration or microscopic levels of concentrations actually, um, you know, cause the kind of harm. So you're, you're triggering reporting at levels that are, are not, um, you know, the evidence doesn't support that they, uh, they are harmful. Uh, so, so is that the way the concern is voiced. And the other item is how impractical it may be out in the field to actually treat these huge volumes of water 
that are associated with uh, municipalities. I mean, I, I understood that in some municipalities, it, it may be the case that all wells could take, you know, could test um, positive for PFAS, and then how do you deal with either treatment of that huge volume, placements, water supplies? These are these are very very big concerns that we're going to have to deal with in the months ahead. Okay, uh, next slide, and turning to um, quickly to some liability issues. Vivi, I'm sorry, just to, just to interrupt you for a moment, I just want to be mindful of time. It's about uh, just right around 12 o'clock. We started about five minutes after the hour. Um, I, I just want to set expectations for folks about how much longer um, you think we can go, just, just so folks have an idea. Thank you for that, Megan. I was looking at the um, clock on my end as well. So we've highlighted for you here in these slides some liability and, and litigation concerns and some things that are happening on, on slides 40 and 41. Um, but let me turn to slide 42 to give you some example of these cases. So we have, um, I want to just um, highlight one that's getting a lot of attention, and that is in Glendale, Ohio. We have the Hardwick litigation against 3M and DuPont. And that's for exposure to A triple F. And that litigation is ongoing, and we'll we'll have to watch that and see how it goes. Next slide. The other um, two items of litigation that are they're very important um, are some litigation against Dupont um, because Dupont spun off a lot of its environmental liabilities, and that litigation um, by Kemmers against Dupont is going to be something to watch want to know the result to that. Next slide. So slide 44, this is an interesting piece of litigation just arose in the last couple of weeks, and this is Earth Justice suing the Defense Department and DLA and waste disposal companies associated with the um, air emissions associated with incinerating PFAS. All right, let me turn now to the um, strategies to address some of these actions in California, because we're seeing some of these, and then we'll, we'll conclude there. So what we're seeing right now is the 13267 orders, as we see on slide 46, and these are investigative orders. They're orders that require you to investigate, and it can require you to furnish um, technical and monitoring reports. And we notice here that the two requirements that emerge is the report has to be deal with the discharge, and the discharge has to be of weight. Next slide. So on slide 47, um, I wanted to highlight for you how um, the state resources board defines discharge. If there's not really a clear definition as there is under CERCLA, but a discharge continues for a lo as long as waste remains in the soil and groundwater and as long as the discharge continues to occur and expand. So on the next slide, I highlighted for you some, um, some arguments. So arguments exist that maybe discharge only, you know, applies to, well, it has to apply to a waste, and it, it, it's not going to, um, necessarily apply to situations where it's the useful application of a product. At least that would be the, the argument, as we mentioned earlier. The other argument is that if you have a stable plume and it's not expanding, um, it doesn't really fit within the state board uh, definition of, of a discharge is one that continues to occur and expand. And there's a whole question about how far back um, Water Code 13 um, can really reach. So the act was enacted in 1970, and historical releases would fall within its framework if they continue to expand. Next slide. So a couple other things to highlight, and that is um, this discharge of waste concept on, on slide um, 49. This is, a, um, this is where we could bring in some RICRA arguments that use of an ordinary product doesn't really constitute a discharge of waste, and we have Ninth Circuit of, um, authority for that that we would use to make those arguments. So I'll stop there on that. And then next slide, 50. Um, the main thing to keep in mind, and many of us already know this, is when we have a regional board order under 13267, 
and here it's based on an underlying state board order, the Water Cold Cold Code only gives us 30 days um, to petition for review, and in the case of litigation um, against the state board, it has to be filed in court within 30 days. So those things have to be negotiated to avoid those, those kinds of um, time frames lapsing. You don't want to waive your rights. And um, you also, on these orders, one of the strategies that we've used is to try to narrow the scope of the order so that it just um, addresses the PFAS chemicals. And then lastly, um, the remaining slides provide for you the Hartwell Corp um, case decision, which you know, basically is very straightforward that there's not liability for um, regulated entities that are regulated by the PUC. So that's an interesting um, position that if cleanup is ever required, um, you can't compete with the directives of the PUC. You kind of have this um, interagency competition and that's not going to be um, consistent with Hartwell. So we'll have to deal with that. So source determination and cleanup are also concerns when you have these, you know, items in the environment and they're so ubiquitous. What is the source? And um, the stockpiling and incineration and, and how that's going to be dealt with in terms of remediation strategies is going to be an issue. As we've highlighted on page um, or on slide 56, there has been some development of um, alternative remediation systems because right now we either stockpile or incinerate and apparently um, other remediation technologies are developing including um, one from AECOM. So we do have some, some help uh, along the way. So I'm going to conclude there. I, uh, we had a section on next on the horizon which I, I mentioned I didn't think I would get to and uh, I'll leave that there for um, for folks to look at on their own. So thank Great. you very much. Great, thank you, Vivi. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just open it up. If you have any questions briefly for Vivi, you can um, put them into the chat and we can try to address those in the next couple of minutes. Um, in the meantime, I just want to thank you again, Vivi, for the presentation and thanks everyone for your patience while we worked out the technical difficulties. I um, really appreciate it. I doesn't, I'm not seeing any questions yet in the chat. Uh, I know that we've gone a little over the time. So perhaps if you do have a question, um, you could shoot an email to info at awe.org and Vivi, I could maybe pass those along and, and um, we could address questions offline if there are any. Um, Absolutely. Great, good, thank you. Thanks again, um, everyone, for joining us. I hope you are all staying healthy and sane during this really uncertain time. I want to invite you all to join us. We have several virtual events and activities coming up on the AWI calendar. We have two weekly or twice a week virtual happiness hours, Tuesday and Thursdays. We're starting a movie night on Sunday using the Netflix party app. So if you're interested in a um, sort of group synchronized viewing of documentaries on Netflix, you can join us on Sunday evenings. Next Wednesday, we have a webinar called Taming Your Inner Critic. So please um, visit the AWI website and sign up for another uh, virtual learning. Uh, we hope you all take care and um, we'll hopefully see you in person very soon. Thanks again, Vivi. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.